The year is 1999, and being a certified mini edgelord, I always preferred the more mature titles. Diablo, Resident Evil, Doom, Silent Hill, and the like were always my favorites. The more violent and dark, the better. When I saw Shadow Man on the shelf at my local blockbuster, I knew that I'd found the game for me. A mysterious man holding a skull, dark imagery, that coveted M rating, everything was there for me to find a new obsession. Unfortunately, back then I had a far shorter attention span, and while I do remember making progress into the game, the large and maze-like environments meant I made very little progress before having to return my rental. I never did go back to complete Shadow Man, but despite my only cursory glance into the world it had created, it had made a small space for itself in a shadowed little corner of my mind. When I saw that Night Dive had remastered it all these years later, those memories came flooding back, and now seemed like a better time than ever to re-explore this game that made such a mark on my young mind. Join me in exploring the dark and haunting world of Deadside 20 years later. The horror, the horror. I embrace it. For many thousands of years, the Shadow Men have protected the world of the living against threats crossing over from the spiritual plane known as Deadside, the place where everyone goes without exception when they die. Michael Lawa is the current heir to the mysteries of this ancient lineage, bearer of the Mask of Shadows. When darkness falls, he becomes the walker between the worlds, immortal voodoo warrior, taker of souls, Lord of Deadside, the Shadow Man. Released for the N64 in the summer of 1999, Developed by Acclaim Studios, Shadow Man received mostly good reviews, and even a sequel that I had no idea existed until doing research for this video. Another one to add to the list. There was also a teaser released for an all-new Shadow Man game, Shadow Man Dark Legacy. Dark spelled D-A-R-Q-U-E, because that is way cooler. Not much info for that game is out yet, but the artwork that they have shown looks great. Might have to finally update my decade-old PC to give it a look on release later this year. But I digress. The Shadow Man games, much like the Turok and Cyber Mage games we've looked at previously, are based on a series of comic books. These ones dating back to 1992. I wouldn't really define myself as a comic book guy, but all these great titles I've been reviewing that got their starts as comics make me want to delve into their worlds a bit more. I would love to read the Shadow Man comics. Another item to add to the bucket list. If I happen to get any Shadow Man diehard fans on the video, just know that this review will be based on the video game specifically, but feel free to educate me on anything that differs in the comic books. We're also playing the Night Dive remaster version, mostly due to ease of accessibility. The game has a cold open with Jack the Ripper in his lair. The year is 1888. The man is lamenting that his many murders have not granted him the immortality that he desires. Before Jack can end it all, a figure, mouth covered in blood, appears out of the darkness. His name is Legion, and he is the main antagonist of our adventure. He's here to recruit Jack, as well as other men whose souls are of an equal hue, to build a great dark engine to power his immortal army and destroy the world of the living. This engine will be housed within a great evil asylum in the world beyond, Deadside. Needing no more information than that, Jack promptly disembowels himself and makes his way into the world of the dead. We cut to a present day scene of our character, the Shadow Man, Michael Lara, and Nettie, a voodoo witch woman, in a darkened room at night. Nettie is warning Shadow Man of a great evil taking form, seeking out the Dark Souls, immortal souls that grant great power. The only way to stop this evil from getting a foothold in the world of the living is to go to Deadside and take the Dark Souls into our own protection before the evil can claim them. She tells us to meet her at her church on the hill at dawn, and we're off. The stage is set for a voodoo adventure spanning the world of the living and the dead. Awesome. Shadow Man can be defined as a lot of things as far as its gameplay goes, and I think sticking it in a single genre is difficult. The best descriptor I can give it is a third-person action-adventure platformer. The game employs a Metroidvania-type style, 
You can travel to locations you've unlocked utilizing a teddy bear that belonged to your dead brother Luke. Your emotional connection to the bear allows you to travel between the worlds of the living and the dead. You can also, you know, just die if you need to get to dead side in a pinch. But that's not so fun. You'll find yourself moving between the various locations, both alive and dead, returning countless times throughout the adventure as you gain new abilities. Most of these new abilities are locked behind various temple trials and tend to focus on fire immunity, from the ability to touch fire, walk on fire, and eventually even swim in liquid hot magma. Outside abilities, you'll also find new areas quite literally gated by coffin doors. Each of these doors will require a shadow level from 1 to 10. Your shadow level is increased by finding the Dark Souls, of which there are a staggering 120. Increasing your shadow level also increases the damage of your shadow gun, allowing you to charge it for higher damage. The combat in Shadow Man is basic, but serviceable. In the world of Deadside, you have access to the Shadow Gun, a chargeable pistol that is generally weak, but gains strength, restores health with kills, and has unlimited ammo. Outside this, you have various voodoo weapons that are used for damage and usually have secondary functions that also open new areas or serve a utility purpose. For example, the flambe weapon can fire a short-range fire attack, but also serves as a torch in dark areas, as well as having the ability to open sealed paper walls. Another is the calabash, a sort of timed explosive that can also be used to open ruined floors. These particular weapons cannot be used in Liveside, at least not at first, but we aren't harmless in that world. Liveside, we have more mundane weapons like our trusty pistol, SMGs, and a couple of shotguns. These more standard weapons are fun, but you'll eventually get access to dead side weapons while in Liveside, and they sort of get overshadowed. Annoyingly, you can't use mundane weapons in dead side ever. This is a bit of a missed opportunity as far as I'm concerned. There are lots of zombies in the underworld, and a good shotgun can't be beat for that. Oh well. Speaking of enemies, there is a good amount of variety. At least for an N64 game. There are melee and ranged enemies, coming in different flavors and difficulties. From slow-moving zombies to fast chainsaw-wielding monsters on the melee side, on the ranged side we have single-shot enemies and machine gunners. Interspersed in this we have weak crawling type enemies, carnivorous fish in the water sections, and even a couple flying type enemies. We of course also have bosses on offer, quite a few of them in fact, but we can touch on each of those individually in the story section of this review. Your health works similar to a Zelda game, where you have a set number of hits and you can increase those hit points by finding the necessary items. Unlike The Legend of Zelda, instead of finding single items to increase your health, you'll be collecting the somewhat common cadeau. Every 100 of these can be exchanged for an extra bar of health, able to increase by 5 extra if you find enough. The next big gameplay element of the game is the platforming, and generally just movement. You can tuck and roll like you're the bearer of the curse here. That's right, I'm making a reference to rolling in a Dark Souls game, and I'm choosing to reference Dark Souls 2, the most unpopular of the Souls games. I like Dark Souls 2. Sue me. This rolling is fine, and useful for a couple of very specific encounters, but honestly, for most enemies, the best strategy is the good old circle strafe. The most challenging encounters are when you need to fight enemies in tight corridors and don't have room to maneuver. You get a really powerful voodoo shield about halfway through the game to help with this, but otherwise, just need to do your best to use corners and careful placement to deal with these situations. The good news is that enemies don't respawn unless you fast travel or change areas. So even the more challenging sections, you can sort of just brute force your way through if you're having trouble. This even applies to bosses. If you really want to, you can just keep dying and returning while slowly whittling their health down. Not that you'll really need to. Shadow Man is more about exploration and atmosphere. None of the fights are particularly challenging. The platforming in Shadow Man is present throughout and is actually probably my favorite part of the game, at least from a gameplay perspective. You can do all sorts of things, from standard jumping to scaling ledges and climbing across ropes. The temple sections where they add in traps and have you do all of this over lakes of lava are a really good time as well. Later in the game, when you've unlocked more of your shadow powers, it gets even more interesting, 
as they add in new ways to throw these into the mix. The only thing I will say with the platforming is the penalty for death is a warp back to the last checkpoint, and these can sometimes be brutally far back. Missing a jump and dying can easily set you back a solid 10 to 15 minutes of progress. The good news is, you can save any time. So if you're having a particularly difficult time with a section, save scumming is always an option. Not that I ever did that. I'm far too talented to require such a crunch. The final gameplay element in Shadow Man is the storytelling. In the game, this is handled through a couple of journals and cutscenes. But if you're watching this video, the storytelling is handled by a man on YouTube who's styling himself as a walrus. So let's get going on that. Shadow Man is just such a wildly unique experience when it comes to its story. I cannot think of another game I've played that even comes close to the setting of supernatural voodoo warrior hunting serial killers through hell. It's pretty damn rad. The uniqueness of the story and atmosphere is leaned into very heavily here, and it just works. The game starts us out in a Louisiana swamp, on our way to Nettie's church. This little segment serves as your basic tutorial to movement in Shadow Man. You have basic jumping and climbing sections to get you comfortable moving about. If you're a terrible person, there are also dogs here that you can get in a fight with, but they're neutral by default. Reaching the church, we get to see in the interaction between Nettie and Michael that Michael isn't completely sold on his position as the Shadow Man, and comes across as a reluctant hero, but also that he blames himself for the death of his brother and believes he deserves any bad things that come his way. This will be story relevant later in the game. Character building aside, Nettie mostly just reiterates the importance of gathering the Dark Souls. Letting Legion get a hold of them would mean apocalypse for the world of the living. She gives us a book containing information on the Five, a group of five serial killers, each in possession of a Dark Soul, and each in need of purging from this Earth. You can read through all their bios here, and damn, these are some twisted sons of bitches. But I think for narrative purposes, we'll talk about each of them as we reach them in the game. Info dumped, we need to get to Deadside and talk to our ally there, Jaunty. It's up to you how you want to travel to Deadside. You can go via Luke's teddy bear, or get there in the more traditional way. In Deadside, we meet up with Jaunty. He's a skull-headed snake with a top hat who likes making wisecracks in what I think is an Irish accent? I told you this game was unique. He chats with us about the asylum that has appeared in Deadside out of nowhere, gives us vague direction to head that way, and opens up the main gate to the underworld for us. Time to get moving. We move through the wasteland of Deadside for a time, finally reaching the first coffin gate and the Paths of Shadow. This area acts as a hub between levels and is a sanctum in Deadside for the Shadow Men past and present. Here we find the Prophecy. A book detailing the end of the world left by the previous Shadow Man, Maxim St. James. This book more or less foreshadows the many upgrades and abilities you'll get along the way, and for the third time, impresses the importance of claiming more Dark Souls. Okay, I get it, I need to gather the Dark Souls. Moving past the wasteland, we eventually reach the outer wall of the asylum. It's here we see just how massive this place is. The front door barred tight, but we can weasel through the fiery tunnels below. We have to be careful as we have no immunity to fire yet, so a single touch of any flaming surface means an instant death. Before long, we're in the asylum. This place is a viscera-filled madhouse. The asylum keepers are committing vile acts on the inhabitants. People in cages being subjected to unspeakable horrors, piles of rotting flesh in every corner, and the constant sounds of buzzing insects only overshadowed by the screams of torture deeper in the facility. This is a bad place. Deep within the facility, we come to our first boss fight, the Seraph Queen. This boss is a good test of our abilities. She teleports around, can attack in melee, fire lightning, or explode for massive damage. No matter, we're the Lord of Deadside and we aren't going to be stopped by a glorified goth girl. Our reward for defeating her is our first set of retractors, and access to the inner sanctum of the asylum. Inside this area we find five separate corridors we can follow, each with a dedicated shrine to each of the five serial killers we are hunting. 
The centerpiece to each of these shrines is a horribly mutilated body suspended above the ground. Each of these bodies will allow us to reach the live side locations of the killers we're hunting, and to use each of the bodies will require a retractor. Lucky for us, we have a set of retractors and decide to go after Milton Pike first. Milton is a Vietnam veteran discharged for the assault of a female officer. He was also indicted for killing his mother, but due to insufficient evidence was acquitted. If that wasn't enough to want to kill this psychopath, he also killed nine other women and two police officers who tried to arrest him. His moniker is the Video Nasty Killer. Due to his tendency to videotape the hunting down and subsequent slaughter of each of his victims. Truly a monster deserving of the fate we have in store for him. Moving back to Liveside, we find ourselves in a sunny environment, in stark contrast to the darkened hellscape we just left. Somehow, despite this, the area we now find ourselves in is no less disturbing. The area Milton stalks is a closed down camp amusement park. The place is covered in signs of police activity, but none of the lawmen are present. We can only imagine the grim fate they met at the hands of Milton, with his history of killing law enforcement personnel. Unfortunately, we hit a roadblock after some time here. We're going to need our shadow powers to proceed, but currently it's daytime and live side, meaning we're little more than a normal man. We return to Nettie with the power of the teddy bear. She lets us know the apocalypse is too near, and waiting for nightfall would surely be a path to oblivion. She does know of a relic, Leclipser, a magic voodoo item split into three pieces that can instantly turn day into night. It's just what we need. The pieces are found in the Paths of Shadow. We can grab one right away, but the others will require a stronger shadow level to access, so we need to get back to finding Dark Souls. In the Wasteland is a side area we missed previously. In there, we find some more Dark Souls and the next boss, Yort. He's, uh, well, I don't know what he is, but he's gross looking. He's pretty simple, just avoid his tail and fungus projectiles, and before long we send him to hell. Actually, this brings up a good point. Aren't we in the afterlife? What is happening to these guys we kill? Aren't they just gonna respawn like we do? Can you die and go to like, level 2 hell? I need to know more. His death nets us a new weapon, the baton. A pointy lance thing that shoots a really crappy hard to aim projectile, but can also be used for teleportation at special altars. Garbage weapon, but good utility. It's about time we start fulfilling the prophecy of the Shadow Man and get some new powers. We can access the Temple of Fire, so let's get in there. This place is one of the first platforming challenges in the game. There's nothing too groundbreaking here, and the biggest struggle I had was figuring out that you can shoot these particular wall panels to progress. At the end of it all, we get elevated into some sort of contraption, get some cool new tattoos, and just like that, we can now grasp flaming objects. This will allow us to climb on flaming ledges and push flaming blocks, opening a lot of new areas of Deadside and the Asylum. Eventually, we gain shadow power to open some new coffin gates. One contains the second piece of Leclipser, the other gives us the Poigny? Sorry, I don't speak French. They're bracers that allow you to climb blood waterfalls. This in turn opens many new areas to explore and gather Dark Souls. I won't beat a dead horse here, but this is pretty well the gameplay loop for a good while here. You unlock an ability, use that ability to gather Dark Souls, get enough Dark Souls to progress, gain a new ability, and repeat. I truly enjoyed the heavy exploration, searching for those last hidden souls in each area, but this is not for someone who doesn't enjoy a bit of backtracking, as you'll be doing a lot each time you unlock a new power. Hell, the highest level coffin gate is located at the very start of the game. Eventually, we gain access to the Temple of Prophecy, similar to the prior Temple of Fire, but this one is much larger, with much more complex traps and platforming challenges. At the end, we're rewarded with firewalking. This is the part of the game that is really going to challenge your memory where to go. Firewalking is probably the biggest upgrade in terms of opening up new paths, and trying to recall where all these paths are is a lot, to say the least. The good news is, we finally have the shadow power to open up the last piece of Leclipser. Bringing all three to Nettie, she conducts a very interesting voodoo ritual to bring on the night. The ritual is a success, but Nettie falls into a deep sleep. Her parting words are to find the five and destroy them. My thoughts exactly. With the world of Liveside plunged into darkness, 
we're able to return to our chase of Milton Pike. He has hidden himself in a complex system of caves and tunnels below the amusement park, but we eventually find him. He calls us boy, and we retort back by fat shaming him. Shadow Man 1, Demon Serial Killer, 0. He isn't a tough fight, he sort of just shoots at you and vaguely moves around. Before long, he's a pile of gore on the ground. First serial killer down, but not the last. Now that we've made it night and unlocked a majority of our powers, things are going to start moving quick with the story. Killing Milton allows for backdoor access to the asylum, and we're able to shut down a piston in the dark engine powering the place. We will need to shut down all these pistons to get to Legion at the heart of it all. Annoyingly, the piston requires solving a puzzle to shut down. I just pressed the buttons at random, and eventually lucked out and got it. Pretty lucky, I suppose. I'm sure there's some way to find this combination, but we'll take the win on this one. Moving on, we've been acquiring more retractors as we've gone through our journey, so on to the next serial killer. I think it's time to take on the man that started all this, Jack the Ripper himself. Using the grotesque portal, we find ourselves in the London Underground, Jack's old stomping grounds. Here we find his journal, just chock full of insane ramblings, but more interestingly, has the combinations for all the pistons in the dark engine. No more guessing for me. I wish I would have come here first, but at least I didn't come here last. This whole area is very atmospheric. You move through the darkly lit underground, attacked by the occasional dog, and even get random encounters from the Ripper himself. He unfortunately ducks away before we can kill him in these ambushes, and we continue to move even deeper underground. Finally, we come to his lair and have a bit of a discourse with him. He believes himself to be the servant of God and above death. We're going to show him that that is false. This fight is a bit more interesting than the others. Jack jumps onto the ceiling and attempts to get over you for a plunging attack. This is further compounded by having the room semi-flooded, slowing you, making rolling ineffective. Regardless, Jack brought a knife to a gunfight, and we turn him into strawberry jam in short order. One more killer down, and one more piston disabled. Next up, Avery Marks. This serial killer is easily the most disturbing, and this level is actually borderline horror. Like, this game is dark and gory, sure, but it's mostly an action game. This is one segment where I was actually getting freaked out. Atmosphere and sound were on point, and similarly to Jack's area, Avery will randomly appear to attack. Unlike the Ripper, Avery fights with a nail gun that is just devastating, so he's an actual threat throughout the level. His intro segment is just such a vivid depiction of a man that is so far beyond being human, it's just wonderfully done. Here's Johnny! What the? I bid you welcome! Enter freely and of your own will! Don't mess with me, little man. Little big man! Little big man! <laughs> Didn't your mama never tell you? It don't matter how big. My mama loves me. She never loved you. My mama kisses me. My mama would never, never, ever kiss you. No, not never, ever kiss you. <laughs> The level itself takes place in an apartment complex, and throughout you'll be finding the results of Avery's work. People turned into rugs, people with the flesh removed from their heads, and possibly most horrifying of all, the people Avery has left alive, but mutilated so badly that death is a welcome blessing. Even Shadow Man, Lord of the Land of the Dead, is visibly disgusted by what he sees. Reaching the end of this carnival of horrors, the fight against Avery himself is a bit underwhelming. He is deadly with his nail gun, but clever use of the shield voodoo power trivializes the fight and he dies as he should have a long time ago. This area was possibly the most memorable of the game. We move on to our next killer, Marco Cruz. This guy's modus operandi was to run people off the road in the Mojave Desert, knock them out with a cattle prod, kill them, and dispose of all evidence even their vehicles. Cruz is in stark contrast to our last killer. He comes across as a goofy disco Elvis type, and honestly his area and backstory was the weakest of all the serial killers. Unfortunately, about halfway through, he blocks our path with fire and we aren't able to proceed. Back into Deadside for one final big upgrade. We can now access the Temple of Blood, the last of our obstacle course temple runs required for the final fire upgrade. 
This temple is surprisingly much less involved than the prior one. And within about 10 minutes, we get our final upgrade. The ability to swim in magma. Perfect. Not only does this open up a lot of opportunities for more Dark Souls, but it will give us fire immunity that we need to take out crews. Weirdly enough, despite being able to swim in lava, getting hit by a fireball trap still damages us. This is some next level video game logic. Anyhow, back to Marco's little slice of heaven. We make it through the flaming building and come face to face with the disco loving psychopath. This fight is so forgettable that I had to look up my gameplay footage to refresh my memory of it. You fight him on a disco floor while silly music plays. Really lackluster experience after the last few atmospheric serial killer areas. Oh well, one more to go. The self-styled Lizard King, Dr. Victor Batrachian. This guy brings it right back to pure evil. Guilty of using his position as a medical professional to trick wealthy women into willing him their fortunes, then killing them and making it look like they died of natural causes. He then went on the run, leaving a string of murders in his wake. His signature move was to somehow make his victims' heads explode from the inside out. He was finally caught and now awaits his deserved end on death row. The man is a complete megalomaniac and gives off serious Hannibal Lecter vibes, minus the eating people. Arriving at the prison holding him, I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. The prisoners and guards alike have had their heads blown up and come back to life as zombies to stop you. The shotgun is a big help here, or just running through. Zombies without heads are generally not very good at giving chase. Making our way to the centralmost area, the doctor is sitting on a chair, truly personifying his self-appointed title of the Lizard King. Funnily enough, the doctor keeps trying to make monologues about being the right hand of God, and continually spouting off about how he's the leader of the five, and Shadow Man just full-on shuts him down by calling him a little puppy dog over and over. Goes to show you can't use logic on a narcissist. Just be like Shadow Man, and call them an infantile name in a mocking voice over and over until they snap. This boss fight is actually weirdly difficult. The Doctor is a melee only enemy, but he is like stupid fast, so it's hard to stay away from the hits. The Voodoo Shield only blocks projectiles, so that's useless here as well. No worries though, we have max health at this point, and just win through attrition. With his death, we disable the last piston and have defeated the five. Only Legion remains. Into the asylum we go. Well, soon. First, because I like you guys and I want to show as much of this game as I can, I went around and collected all 120 Dark Souls, allowing me to open the secret coffin gate and get the Book of Shadows, a fun little easter egg packed full of Shadow Man concept art. There's some really good stuff in there. Also, in the room you find it in is a strange fetus suspended in a ball. I have literally no idea what that's about, but I'll assume it's an easter egg that I'm just not privy to. Worth noting, there is another secret door, but it's locked behind gathering all 666 cadeaux spread throughout the world. I'm a completionist, but not to that much of a degree. Consider it incentive to play through the game yourselves. Okay, now we can go and face Legion. Back in the Dark Engine, we cross the now disabled pistons, and who do we see but our little brother Luke. And he's scared, and in need of help. He also clearly has blood all around his mouth, just like Legion. That must be a coincidence though. There's no way there's any correlation. It 100% makes sense that our dead brother would be here on the far side of the engine. In Legion's seat of power, there's no chance there's any tomfoolery going on. We chase him down, and to our massive surprise, Luke was Legion in disguise, luring us into a trap. What a twist that no one could have seen coming. He takes our teddy bear so we can no longer leave the area. We get a pretty long cinematic here between Shadow Man and Legion. Essentially what it all boils down to is that Legion is the one who wrote the prophecy millennia ago. He influenced the voodoo women to get Shadow Man to gather the Dark Souls. This has been his plan centuries in the making. Essentially, he wanted you to gather the souls so he'd get you here, kill you, and take them for himself. The obvious flaw in this plan is that we now have within ourselves all 120 Dark Souls, and are powerful enough to stand against Legion. The fight begins similar to the Dr. Batracian fight, in that he charges you in melee while you duck and weave out of the way. This phase doesn't last long, and we get a cinematic of Legion morphing into his true and terrible form, a twisted amalgamation of flesh, bone, and gore. 
Pretty cool. This phase is longer, but much easier. The floor is opened up beneath us, and jumping down reveals some supplies and enough room to maneuver. Legion doesn't do much more than shoot waves of slow-moving projectiles, with the occasional instant beam attack. So long as you keep moving around him in a circle, you're safe. Before all too long, he's incapacitated. In his weakened state, we dump all the Dark Souls into Legion, overloading what he can handle and destroying him at last. With his death, the entire asylum begins to crumble around us. Time to make a speedy retreat. And with that, we're pretty much done. We get one more short monologue from Shadow Man. He embraces his role as the Lord of Deadside and the credits roll. A superb ending to a superb game. This review is a bit long, so we'll pick out the bits worth mentioning. There is no map or hint system of any kind that I could find. So quite a lot of the time I found myself running around with no clue of what I should be doing, or where I should be going. My dude, you played this for 16 hours. There's literally a where to go next in the fast travel menu. A giant orange exclamation mark appears in any area with something to discover, and updates in real time with each upgrade so you know exactly where new things can be found. And yes, there isn't a traditional map, but the Book of Prophecy has an overview world map to help you find each of the many coffin gates. Not that it's needed, the hub area for the levels is pretty logically laid out. I loved the original game on the N64 when I was 5 years old, but now this has tainted my fondness for the game, and personally wish I could go back and stop myself from buying this remaster. I mean, I think one of the main things this remaster did was add in the aforementioned hint system. You know, the one you wish the game had? I'm not trying to be too harsh here, but damn man, you're complaining about the remaster sucking because it added what you thought it was lacking? Wild take. Do Legacy of Kane slash Soul Reaver next. To end this on a positive note, yes, this 100%. Amazing game series. Next up, game has massive FPS drops if you use the weapon wheel, using 3070. FPS crashed from 60 to 5 FPS every 5 minutes. Game otherwise seems promising, but won't play till this is fixed. This game has a weapon wheel? I just opened the inventory to change weapons. I'm sorry guy from the previous review who couldn't find the hint system. Turns out I missed a major function as well. Guess we're both unobservant. There isn't a whole lot more to say about this game besides, it is amazing. A true hidden gem if ever there was one. A wonderfully unique setting, fun varied weapons and powers, and a startling amount of content. For reference, this playthrough took me about 19 hours. I did see most of the things the game has to offer, but definitely could have extended it to 20 plus if I really wanted to fuel my inner completionist. Despite that high length, it didn't outstay its welcome. If anything, I could have taken another 10 hours. I felt like things were just heating up when we ended. There's also a ton I didn't show in this video. This map of the world shows just how many different areas there were to explore, and each of those areas had hours of exploration. While many were similar in their aesthetic, they each had their own sort of overarching vibe. The asylum entries served to show the violence and depravity of the giant prison. The lava ducts had an industrial fire and brimstone feeling, and the playrooms was truly a saddest dream. Each area's unique and fitting music only heightened the immersion. And just overall, I know I'm repeating myself, but I cannot think of any other game that has since or before employed this setting to this degree of success. I feel like even if you dislike the game, you won't forget the setting. It's just beautifully dark and one of a kind, worthy of its cult following and then some. All this gushing to say, give the game a go if you like retro games, and like things with a bit of a dark edge. You won't go wrong here, just don't lose your teddy bear. See you in the next video.